there's a story. There's a story that Jesus told about a good Samaritan. Don't hear that story much in Christendom. But it's about the good Samaritan. Hallelujah. In the book of Luke, the 10th chapter, you'll find it in the 30th verse. Jesus begins a story about a man, a certain man. Let, let, let's read it. Luke 10, verse 30, simply says this. And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, beat him and wounded him. And then they departed and they left him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest. The priest came down that way. And when he saw him laying there beaten and bruised, bleeding and half dead, he crossed the street and went on the other side. Hallelujah. He went on the other side. Come on. And likewise a Levite. When he was at that place that the, that the man was beaten, came and looked at him. Came and looked over him as he lay there bleeding. And then passed by on the other side. And a certain Samaritan. I'll get to that in a moment. And a certain Samaritan as he journeyed, came where this man was beaten, bleeding, bruised, broken. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring an oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him and took care of him and took care of him and on the morrow on the next day when he departed he took out two pieces two pence and gave them to the host and said unto them please take care of this man and whatever you spend more than what I just gave you, when I come again, I will repay it. I know we did our shouting on the front end. Now we do our mission. Now let me explain to you something about the Samaritans. The Samaritans were ostracized by the Jews. The Samaritans were considered to be bastardized because they had commingled with Gentiles. Samaritans were mudbloods. They were not purebred. Amen. And the Jews had nothing to do with them, although the Samaritans were more astute at the law than the Jews were. Hallelujah. The Samaritans kept the law more diligently than the Jews did. And they worshiped in Mount Jerusalem. They worshiped up in the Mount Jerusalem while the Jews worshiped down in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Are you hearing me? It's amazing how religion can be so divided and cultural. The one God, but we, he, the one God is subject to our idiocies. He becomes subject to our silliness. Hallelujah. And these, the, these divides in religion are, are long tooth. They are ageless. We've had divide in religion for a long time. And it has marginalized our ability to help those in need. 
It has caused us to put more credence in what we do and don't realize that Jesus made a statement that said there were many other sheep that are not a part of our fold. There are many other sheep that don't belong to our reformations or our or organizations. They're not a part of our denominations and they need Jesus more so than we can give credit. We don't realize how detrimental this day is and how needful it is for us to lay down all of these sillinesses and link arms and become powerfully united. I can't even get a whole house of affirmation here. Look at what religion has done. I can't even get the saints in my house to affirm this. And that, is our, that becomes our problem. We have not learned how to be that good Samaritan. We are too busy fighting fights that are just chaotic, just fighting windmills, fighting fights that are absolutely chaotic. We're fighting windmills. We're fighting each other. We're still talking silly stuff. What a woman can preach or what a woman can wear. We're still fighting silly stuff. I don't hear anybody here. Whether you're baptized in Jesus' name or baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We're still fighting silly stuff. Hallelujah. Whether you worship on Saturday or whether you worship on Sunday, we're still fighting silly stuff. Y'all gonna come alive, but maybe y'all just tired. I'm not gonna dance y'all so hard in the next time. I forgot that some of us are older. When we dance, it's over. You know, it's done. We're still finding silly fights. People trying to get position. I'm called to be a preacher. I'm called to be a minister. I'm called to be a prophet. I'm called to be a bishop. I'm called to be an archbishop. I'm a while people are suffering and dying. Y'all hear what I'm saying? You trying to be an evangelist, you trying to be a missionary, while people are literally laying down and dying. And we're walking on the other side of the street. I keep telling people, stop, stop chasing titles. It is a waste of time because when you get the title, you don't use it. Oh, stop playing with me. You get the title and you sit down on your haunches and you let time go by while you boast like you somebody great. You're not great because you have a title. You're great because you do the work. And those that do the work don't need a title. You better hear what I'm telling you. Titles get in the way of the work. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm an evangelist. Then why aren't you out in the field? Those are field titles. Evangelists don't belong in the church. Pastor belongs in the church. Evangelist belongs out on the field. Who's in the field? I'm a missionary. I got my missionary license. Then where's your mission? What is your mission? Sister, brother, what is your mission? There are people that are ailing out there that need you to come and help them. There are people that need to be fed that need you to come and help them. I don't hear anybody here. There are people that are sick that need you to come and help them. There are people in prison that need you to come and help them. There are people in the hospital that need you to come and help them. Why are you in the sanctuary? Why are you in the sanctuary? You want the title. 
but who's in the field? A missionary is a field position. Nobody? A missionary is a field position. Give me 15 more minutes on the clock. No, no, that's good enough time on the clock. A field position. While everybody is clamoring in the house, doing their due diligence to get a certificate to make themselves known amongst the leaders so that they can become a leader while they lead no one. While you lead no one, you just want to sit closer to the front. You just want to put a collar on. You just want to have a boasting right. You don't want to do the job. And I'm not just talking hypothetically, I'm talking about the people in-house and online as well. You don't want the job, because if you really did the job, you wouldn't need the title. If you did the job, we wouldn't be able to fit in this house. If you did the job, somebody's heart would be helped. If you did the job, somebody's needs would be met. If you did the job, someone would see the light of Jesus. If you did the job, someone would be overcome by the love of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A good Samaritan. Remember, re remember that woman at the well. That woman that Jesus sent his disciples away because him as a rabbi couldn't let his followers come into Samaria, Samaria because it was against the Hebrew law to come into Samaria. So he sent them to go get some food. Well, I must needs go to Samaria. And he went on. And he went at the beginning of the day sat on the well for six hours waiting because he knew that his targeted audience wasn't coming at 6 a.m. with the rest of the women because he knew that she couldn't come with the rest of the females because she was scarlet lettered she had an ill reputation she was a marked woman and through their, uh, through their abuse, it mandated that she came in the heat of the day. <laughs> at, the, at, at the highest rising of the sun, at the hottest point of the day. And he waited. Waited on Jacob's well. Waited there. And then finally he saw coming uphill a woman struggling with a wooden bar across her shoulders and with pots and pails on the end of each of, of this wooden bar. Yeah. She's coming to get water, but this is unceremonious because she's supposed to come at 6 a.m. with the rest of the women. And as she is sweating and walking up the hill with this wooden bar across her shoulders, with pails clanking. She gets to the well as she does every day at noon and she finds a Hebrew, a Jew sitting on the well. Am I telling the story? She finds a Hebrew sitting on the well. She can't get around him. He's strategically placed so that she's got to run into him. You've got to strategically place Jesus so that people have got to run into him. you got to represent so that they have to run into Jesus. And you got to use whatever's available to get their attention. The well was available. So he used the well and the water to get her attention. He didn't start off spiritual. He started off with what her need was. He started off with her problem. He started off, hallelujah, in the place of her need. Because she needed water. So he's going to use water as a way to reach her. 
When you find people in sin, you got to understand and you got to use their circumstance in order to introduce Jesus. I don't hear nobody here. I'm going to keep on teaching till somebody catch on fire till we develop some evangelists in this house. And uh, I feel too cogent right now. And when the woman came close and found this Hebrew Jewish rabbi, which represented the group of people that hated the Samaritans. She already passed judgment on him. She already got an attitude. Soon as she saw this dude, had no respect for him. Religion could cause you to lose respect while everybody's fighting their own denominational fights. And Jesus starts evangelism. He says, woman, give me to drink. And her tood showed up. Oh, you got to read the Bible when you read the Bible. You got to read the Bible when you read the Bible. Her tood showed up. She couldn't care less about the Semitic law that a married woman shouldn't be talking to an unmarried man and a man shouldn't be talking to a woman without a husband. She said, how be it that you Being a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, for what? Stop playing with me. Stop. I'm not in the mood for you, man. Stop playing with me. You know you ain't supposed to be talking to me. I'm just putting a little edge on it right now so y'all can understand it. You know you ain't supposed to be talking to me. Stop playing with me. I ain't got time right now what you asking me for water for just wanted to make it a little more urban for you and jesus turned around and matched energy with energy you can't be afraid when people show you a certain energy you can't tuck tail and run when somebody pushes back against you you got to have enough spiritual wisdom to know how to take that energy and turn it back on them. Did you hear what I said? You got to learn how to take that energy that they're giving out and turn it back on them so that they can understand. Oh, he said, woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asking you for water you would ask me for water hallelujah she said ask you for water you don't even have anything to draw with stop playing with me you ain't got no bucket you ain't got nothing to draw no water with and you talking about I be asking you for water man I don't I done heard all the men pushing up on me before. This ain't nothing new, dude. You ain't even got nothing to pull no water with. He said, if you drink from this well. Girl, if you drink from this well, you gonna thirst again. But if I gave you some water, again she said well he 
He said, because this water that I would give you would be a well of water springing up. I'm trying not to cry. I'm trying not to cry. I'm trying not to cry. Springing up to eternal life. Carol, you would never have the thirst again like you're thirsting. She said, well, give me this water so I don't have to thirst again. I never have to come back to this well. What she wasn't saying was, the reason why I'm coming now is because religion has jacked me up. Religion has messed me up. And nobody's come to help me. Religion has messed me up and those that are in the religious sect I'm from have ridiculed me and nobody's come to restore me because they see me as used and tainted goods, damaged goods. She said, give me this water so I don't have to come back here no more. He said, okay, but now I got to do this the right way. Go get your husband. Because I'm not supposed to talk to you without your husband. And the dude came back. I ain't got no husband. I know what you're trying to do, my brother. I know, I know, I know you're trying to push up on me. I ain't got no husband. Now what? It was an attitude. I'm not, I'm not adding in. I'm just showing you what you missed. I don't have a husband. He said, you say right when you say you don't have a husband. Because indeed you've had five husbands. And the man that you shacking with right now. The man that you shacking with right now ain't your husband so you said right when you said you ain't got no husband but he did it with compassion because he was the one who's come to help her in her need The story that he told, the Samaritans were known to help people in their need. But somehow they didn't help each other. Hmm. The story in Luke, Jesus talks about a certain man and priests and a Samaritan who helped. The Samaritan helped the man from Jerusalem but Jerusalem wasn't helping the woman from Samaria. Am I taking too much time? Go get your husband. The reason why that that's important is because there's a story that's not written. What is the story that's not written, Pastor? She wasn't a whore. She didn't divorce five men. Five men divorced her. Why is that important? Because a woman in Semitic law was not able to divorce a man. Denise, am I right? Am I right? A woman could not give a husband a writ of divorcement. Only a husband could divorce a woman. So if she's been divorced five times, that means one by one, a man married her, used her, and disposed of her. And the second man saw the used goods, married her, used her, and gave her a writ of divorcement. And then a third man saw a very attractive woman but was totally torn down and had no self-esteem and married her and used her 
and then threw her away. And then a fourth man found this damsel and married her and used her and then threw her away. And with each throw away, she became so broken. Imagine you were broken after your first divorce. You were broken after your first relationship. Imagine having four and they all fail. And with each one, you are thrown out. She marries the fifth one. And he does the same thing. And then the sixth one says, you are so used and damaged, so nasty, so worthless, nobody wants you. So come on and live with me, but I'm not going to marry you. You can stay here and let me use you, but I'm not even going to give you my name. And the one that you're with now is not your husband. So you, you told the truth when you said you don't have a husband. He was preaching to her brokenness. Our job is to help people in their brokenness. No, no. Our job is to see someone broken and remember how broken we were. And to help them in their brokenness. To see when someone hurting and remember how badly we hurt. And to shed all of our trappings of, of, of position and become common enough to help them in their place of need. To be that good Samaritan. To be that person who goes past the point of, of pleasure and comfort to get into the place of purpose. And to make someone understand that Jesus loves them. Are you hearing me? So he preached to her pain. And once he preached to her pain, she grabbed a hold of hope that somebody cared enough to come get her, to come help her. And she shifts. Am I boring you? Now, I'm not preaching today. I'm just teaching. And she shifts and leaves her attitude in the dust and realizes somebody's here to help me. When you show you care, when you show you care, people will let their guard down and realize somebody's here to help me. I don't know how they're going to help me, but somebody's here to help me. And I got to be, I got to, I got to, I got to accept their help because I, 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 I can't live like this anymore. And she shifts. And she says, I perceive that you're a prophet. Yeah. Well, you're almost right, girl. You're almost right. Now your attitude is gone. And you start talking about worship. Wait a minute. Your, your people say, my people say that you worship up here in Mount Jerusalem. Your people say that you worship in Jerusalem. Who's right? Now, wait, you just went from telling them off. You just went from shaking your neck and snatching the air and telling them off and he got to your pain. He got to the real you. All you got to do is get to the real you of a person. And then all of a sudden the questions start. That's how you know that the real person's coming out when the questions start. You say that you should worship in Jerusalem. We say that you should worship up in the mountain. Who's right? When you hear a person asking questions, don't poo-poo them. They're on a journey. And they have confidence in you. Even if they don't receive your answer right away, they have enough confidence to present the question to you. Don't turn them away. Who is right? Where shall... You worship Jesus and her girl. 
You worship what you don't even know. It's not in Jerusalem. And it's not up here in this mountain. You don't hear what I'm saying, y'all. You worshiping what you don't really know. Because you're worshiping based on your reformation. And he said, but God is not a part of your reformation. God is not bound to a temple in Jerusalem. And he's not bound to a synagogue up in the mountains. For God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks some, he seeks people to worship him like that. He doesn't want you to worship him based on your denomination. He doesn't want you to worship him based on your reformation. He wants you to worship him based on spirit. Based on the spirit. And based on the truth of the word. You better hear what I'm saying. It's not about taste, not touch, not handle, not that. It's about the truth of the Bible. It's not about what you wear. It's about who you wear. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Take off the old man who is corrupt with deceitful lusts be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man hallelujah it's not what you wear it's who you wear and if you wear the Lord Jesus he'll give you what to wear Holy Ghost convicts I'm preaching old time Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost convicts. Please forgive me. I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm going left right quick. Holy Ghost convicts. He lets you know if it's too tight. He lets you know if it's too short. He lets you know if it's too much. Holy Ghost convicts. Oh yes he does. Just want to throw that out there. If you can see it, we can see it. Just hit somebody next to say, holiness, holiness, holiness. Sit down, let me finish. I'm already, already one minute over time. Because when you receive Jesus, you will change. You don't receive Jesus and remain the same. When she realized that this guy is not normal, that this guy must be a prophet, she changed. They say you're supposed to worship in the mountain or Jerusalem. God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And she says, I got another revelation. We heard that the Messiah, you went from dude to prophet. Are y'all seeing this thing? Went from dude to prophet. We heard that the Messiah would come. Are you him? This is the first person he tells. So when you say a woman's not supposed to preach, he didn't even tell his 12 disciples. Y'all not hearing me. So to everyone watching, when you say a woman's not supposed to preach, why would Jesus keep telling the women the good news? Somebody help me make sense of this. Why would 
Jesus give the women the good news to go and tell? Somebody help me here. Why wouldn't he say, go get some of the priests from your Samaritan and let me tell them? She said, are you him? Uh, David, I forgot how you're supposed to say it. That, that is him? What is that supposed to be? That, that is him? Huh? Huh? He is him. Yeah. The kids are teaching me idioms. He. Are you him? I'm him. And she breaks out running. And she don't go to the women. Oh, this is so revelation. To, this is such a revelation to me. She don't go to the women. She runs to the men, Jace. And she says, come. What you screaming about? Come. Why are you talking to me? Come. See. Come see a real man. Somebody who just helped me. Somebody who saw me. Somebody who heard me. Somebody who felt my pain. Come see a real man. Somebody who didn't condemn me. Somebody who lifted me. Somebody who freed me. Come. Come. See a man. Why did she drive that man so hard? Because she's talking to men that didn't act like men who needed to see a real man that could change their life like he changed hers. Come see a man who told me everything that I have done. Sorry, you preachers. I'm not, I'm not. I'm not. I'm going to get some emails. That's okay. But just exegete that scripture. Exegete that. Just, just do your works on that. Amen. So what I was trying to say. As, we, as I close. As I close. The work of the Good Samaritan became historic. This was not a fictitious story. If Jesus said there was a certain man, there was a certain man. I've already taken up too much of your time, but we want to be a church of purpose. I don't care if we don't swell in numbers to five and 10,000 people. There are other churches that God has given the assignment. I don't care if I don't have five talents, if I've just got two. I will never, I will never berate those that have five. Amen. Well, they must not be living right to get that many people. No, stop with the jealousies and the envies. They've been assigned five because it was in the capacity to do it. Every man according to their abilities. So if we're a two talented church, then we've got to multiply those two talents to four. And we've got to put our finger on the pulse of need. And where there's a need, we must go and fulfill it. <laughs> 